podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. Our New Year's Day edition is a best of some memories uh, from last year, 2021. Some of the best moments. Thank you for listening all year long. I look forward to having a great time with you in 2022. Here you go. Episode 1855. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. It's Leo Laporte taking the week off for the holidays. I hope you get to do the same. We're relaxing on this New Year's Day, and uh, I'm very glad you tuned in. Of course, we're not going to do a brand new show for you, but I did think it'd be kind of fun to put together some of our best moments from 2021, starting with little Nathan. <laughs> he wanted to know, should I switch to Linux? Hi, Nathan. Hello. Like hot, like the hot dog. Do you know Nathan's yeah. hot dogs? Yeah. Okay. What is? What do you say when when? Because uh, when I was a kid, I I used to say my name is Leo, as in Mayo. That that was a bad idea. What do you say when people ask you, "What's your name again"? I say Nathan. Oh, <laughs> simple, uh, short, and sweet. So, what can I do for you, Nathan? Yeah. So I have a question about the Linux operating system. Ah, okay. You are the future. Nice. Okay. So. Um, okay. I'm okay, Leo. Calm down. He says. Yeah. Um, and on Windows, and I was wondering, would it be a good idea to switch to Linux? Uh, for you, yeah. So are you pretty comfortable with Windows these days? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're comfortable. You're happy. You're good. You, you know how to use technology and all that. Mm -hmm. here's, here's why Linux would be an interesting thing for you to do. It's going to be a little frustrating. Nathan, you're going to do stuff and... You're going to say, I don't know how to do this. I know how to do this in Windows. Uh, how do you do this? But you will learn so much. And really, the most important thing you'll be learning is about Unix-based operating systems. U-N-I-X. You know that term? Have you heard that term before? I, don't, I think, but I don't know what it means. Yeah. It, so back in 1970, before there was Windows, before there was Mac, before there was DOS, there was Unix, U-N-I-X. -I and it was the most powerful computer operating system out there. And it lives on in a lot of different ways. About When you surf the net, for instance, most of the servers that you're going to are running on a Unix variant. Linux is the most common, but there are others as well, BSD. And even Macintosh is based on a form of Unix. So Unix is kind of the original operating system. And I think learning it would be great. Do you, you, do you want to have a tech career when you, when you grow up? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think th people who have an understanding, there's a whole bunch of people who just work in Windows. They use .NET, the program in C Sharp or JavaScript or whatever, TypeScript. And, you know, they use Microsoft products and they can, and there's certainly there are plenty of jobs for those people. But the people who really have uh, the world is their oyster, whether they want to develop websites or they want to get a great job as an IT person or as a programmer. Those people, I believe, are also familiar with Linux. So what you would be doing is you'd be kind of getting a jump start on your future. And, you know, maybe the thing to do, it's a little more complicated, is make a dual boot. So you have one machine that can run either Windows or Linux, depending on your mood when you first start it up. So if you need to do schoolwork, for instance, are you using this computer for school? School gave us Chromebooks. Oh, good. Cool. Oh, guess what? Chromebooks are running Linux. But you, you can't really... You, 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 in fact, if you want to get to Linux, I don't know how well the school has locked it down, but there are ways to... Oh, they our computers. Yeah, they, they lock it down. They won't let you do anything. But Chromebook, the operating system for Chromebooks is called Chrome OS. It's a Linux... It's a version of Linux, which is a free open source operating system. And what they did is, is they basically made it Chrome running on top of the Linux. And that's what you use is the Chrome browser. But Linux is under the hood. And if you have a normal Chromebook, it's very easy to get into the terminal and start using Linux commands. You can even install uh, without removing the Chrome OS part of Linux. So you're already using Linux. You just They just lock it down so you can't see it. Um, 
That's I think you're I think yes you should learn it. It would be a great ha, What do your folks think cuz I mean they're the ones who I presume they own the computer unless you bought it with your allowance or something. Oh no. They they don't they don't have an opinion. They don't know. <laughs> they don't know. You're the, you know, you're the tech guy in the family, right? I guess so. Yeah. So you get to yes. If if you're allowed, just ask ask mom and dad. Say, can I can I modify this computer? Because I I want to. And you know what? If you say I want to learn more about computers, because I think I might want a career in computers, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing you could do, get them to give you thirty five bucks and buy a Raspberry Pi. Hey, Paul. Hi, Leo. Thank you for taking the call. Uh, talking about traveling, I'm absolutely agreeing. As soon as uh, as soon as they give us the green signal, we're out of here. We've already got reservations Can't wait. for uh, Kauai in April oh. and France in September. Oh, so, you're a man after my own heart. I love Kauai and I love France. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. We'll meet you there. Yes. We'll you there. Deal. <laughs> hey, um, I've got 35 old uh, VHS tapes. Um, I, I, I uh, solicited one of those services that they uh, send the tapes, and they wanted six hundred and fifty dollars to convert them to digital. How many tapes? I'm wondering, uh, thirty-five. Thirty-five. Well, that's not bad for thirty-five tapes. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, yeah. that's a lot. You know, they have to transfer. It's hard to do that, but you could do it yourself. My advice would be do it soon because. The uh, the material they use for magnetic recordings, like that VHS or audio recordings, mm -hmm. it's a mylar backing with a magnetic, you know, material and kind of iron material on top of it. And boy, 10, 15 years down the road, it starts to flake off. They're they're not going to be real playable much longer. So yeah. they they may already. How old are they? Well, some of them are longer, older than that. Of so course, yeah, and, yeah. And I hate I hate sending them to a service and then finding out that uh, they're going to charge me even though there's nothing on the tape. So right, I don't blame you. Yeah. So do, do do I buy an old VHS player and and do you think that these uh, converting um, what do they call it quick clear click uh, DVD wizard? Yeah, you could do that. What I would do instead, and I don't know how much longer these devices are going to be around. But they make VCRs or VHS machines that have built-in DVDs. Uh, they were they were really designed uh, for you. <laughs> they made it for you, uh, for people who are kind of in this intermediate where they have VHS tapes, but they want to digitize them, and they're not expensive. Um, so what you do on these? I mean, it's real time. So thirty-five tapes sure. is going to take a while. What you do is you put the tape in, you put a blank DVD in, and you press play, and it records, copies them over. And because it does it all in one uh, fell swoop, you know, it's it's a lot easier and probably a lot less expensive. Um, so let me just make sure they're still selling. Yeah, they're still selling them. They're, they call them combo players. Some of them, wow, they're, so, they're, they're going up in price. They used to be a few hundred bucks. It might be cheaper to get, to get the surface to do it, but I would I would look around maybe on eBay see if you can find one of those. It's uh, you know your you, the risk is if you put a tape in there that's flaking off, it could destroy the VHS player. Well, I'll so. start with the old uh, the newer ones. First. Yeah, start with the newer ones. Get them get there put put them in reverse chronological of order of age, uh, so you're most likely to survive them. Sometimes what they'll do is uh, what we used to do with uh, audio tape is bake it, uh, which would harden the ferrous coating, but would only give you one playback. <laughs> You'd have one chance to digitize it. So because there are people, you know, if you think about it, there are magnetic audio recordings going back 50, 60 years more. You know, Miles Davis, Kind of Blue, recorded in the 50s. You know, you want to get those things digitized as quickly as you can. There's lots of Beatles recordings still on uh, eight-track tape at uh, Abbey Road Studios. You want to get those digitized if you can. I think they did a big, they did a big uh, digitization program on the uh, Abbey Road tapes a while ago. Um, well, let me think of what else. Yeah, if you if you can't find one of the converter packages, and it may be, you know, this, the, the, there really was a, a limited time frame where they were useful, where the people had a lot of tapes. Um, now it's kind of a dwindling mass of people. Uh, if you can't find that, yes, you can buy a v VHS player. They're cheap, 30 bucks. 
Yes. Nobody wants them. And then uh, connect it up to one of these video capture cards. The output of the VHS player will be what we call, a, a, there may be a couple of choices. There'll be the red, white, and yellow RCA plugs. That's composite video. If it has an S, an S video, that's better quality. It's not digital still. Nobody will have digital probably. But S video would be the best. But then you'd need a capture card that supported an S video in. Uh, and ideally, you'd have a capture card that wasn't, well, you don't have much choice. But you want, USB 2 is so slow that the card, the device has to highly compress the video. I think with VHS, it probably doesn't matter. But you you want the fastest converter box you can get. If it supports USB 3, that would be better. Because then it, will, then it won't have to compress the video as much. And then you'll input it. They usually come with some sort of software to record. Uh, if not, there are lots of choices out there. It, uh, I would say you probably don't want to burn it to DVD because uh, it's better just to keep digital. Then you have all sorts of flexibility. You could, if, if, Aunt, if sure. Aunt, Aunt, uh, Aunt Florence wants a copy of it uh, you, and she only has a DVD player, you could burn it to DVD as needed. But uh, the digital Super. copies are going to be the best quality. Super. Thanks so much, Leo. My pleasure, you. yeah. There's even, you know, if you have a tower PC, most people these days, I don't know if people have slots anymore. If you have slots, you can buy PCI capture cards as well. Those will work a little bit better. In fact, a lot better. Um, Hapog used to make those. Lots of companies. Promise. H-A-U-P-P-A-U-G-E. Worst name in technology. It's a town in Long Island. And I guess they're very loyal to this town in Long Island. But good luck <laughs> finding a pog on the web, h a p p a u g e dot com, and uh, they also make these capture cards. They're they're pretty good. They've been doing that for a long, long time. They love Long Island, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> they love their town so much they named themselves after it. Might have been a mistake. I don't know. Yeah, Hopog uh, makes TV tuners. You don't want a tuner. You want a capture card. Um, for for Windows, uh, Elgato used to make great ones for the Mac, but they got purchased. Um, but I think they they uh, sold their iTV brand, so it's uh, yeah somebody else bought it, Genia Tech. So that's another good one if you're on a Mac. The uh, i iTV E Y E T V. Anyway, I've got a question. I've heard you talk about uh, Google Photos changing in the future. Yeah, soon now. Uh, yeah, June. Yeah. And I use the, what I do is, the feature that I'm concerned about is I take uh, pictures with my pocket phone, mm -hmm. and then I get home and it's on my iPad. I know, isn't that awesome? And I want you to lead us into something else that will do that. <laughs> well, fortunately, there are lots of choices. So Google, the change Google's making in June is that used to be unlimited uh, low quality, and they really weren't low quality. They really were high quality JPEGs, but they were they were slightly compressed from the originals. Unlimited storage for those forever. And in fact, everything you upload until June uh, will continue to be stored there forever for free. So it's not like, at least according to Google, it's not like at some point they're going to start charging for you. It's only after uh, June, I guess it's June 15th, that Google's going to start charging you for storage everything already up there is there and will be continue to be free so i think they they handle that as well as you can expect it people are unhappy when anything that was free now is not but i think they're handling it fairly well so if you don't want to pay for google drive storage which is fairly economical so you may make the decision to do that uh the key is you want something for free you know, you already know because you're, if you're using an iPhone you can use and an iPad, you can use iCloud to do exactly the same thing and the same results. But it's not free. You have to pay for iCloud storage. And Apple storage is not the cheapest. It's Google's actually less expensive, I think. There are other ways to do this. If you're an Amazon Prime customer, are you an Amazon Prime customer? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, good news. They offer unlimited storage of originals for free. So that's one of the benefits of Amazon Prime. You need the Amazon Photos app to do that. And you can put right. that okay. on, your, on your camera phone and you can put that on your iPad. Free unlimited storage as long as you're a Prime member. And 
you know, Amazon Prime's gotten more and more expensive. I just got my bill. It was 100, I think it's 120 bucks now. Um, but they're giving you more and more features. So, and the nice thing is, unlike the Google deal, this is uh, full resolution. They're, they're not compressed. So you get the, the right. originals. You also get five gigs of uh, video storage. So you can store your videos up there too. And, uh, and Amazon is pretty much the low price leader for storage. It's two bucks a month for every additional 100 gigabytes. But again, that's just for video because photos are free. There are some other companies that do this. Uh, a company that uh, has been around for a long time, you might remember as a photo printing company, Shutterfly, Sure. Also offers free storage of originals, unlimited. The reason is they make their money on prints. And so they figure, well, if all your images are there, you might well send Aunt Judy uh, the link and she might well, well want to make a, a mouse pad or a calendar or a mug or just a photo print. And so we're going to make some money. So yeah. okay. Sh Shutterfly is another one. You can put the app on your phone. It'll automatically copy it up, and then you'll be able to see it on your iPad at the Shutterfly website. They say, free, unlimited, secure photo storage. We will never delete your photos. That doesn't mean we'll never charge you for it. Although, as I remember, I think Shutterfly is about to do an IPO. What did I, there's some financial thing that just happened with Shutterfly. Yeah, they're going to do an IPO. They're going to issue common stock, which means they'll probably be cash cash rich for a little bit uh, a little while well they're already public what is going on with shutterfly did they just get acquired something in the back of my mind's tickling my my mind anyway there's there's a couple of extras amazon prime okay. members shutterfly those are free unlimited storage okay sounds good Pretty. yeah what, what you're losing is some of the features the smart features that uh, Google gives you. I, I love it that I can upload photos to Google and it will automatically do recognition. Now, some people might get very nervous about that, but it'll automatically, I can then search for pictures of dogs. I can then search for pictures of Paris. I can even picture search for pictures of dogs in Paris. And it does a very good job of finding them. There are a few cats in my dog pictures. I admit it, but it's a pretty good way. So the idea with for me with Google is you just upload everything you take a picture of. <laughs> might as well. Because you you don't have to categorize them or organize them. You just uh, just do a Google search. Sputter, Shutterfly, this chairman is telling me, is in talks to go public through a merger with a blank check company. Okay. Is that a SPAC? Okay. So Shutterfly went public in 2006, went private again a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, and now is thinking about going public again. I've, you know... It's, I would I would use them all. Why not? I That's what I do. I upload it to everything. I even have my own local cloud storage. That's another way to do it. It's a little more expensive up front because you have to buy local storage if you have a network-attached storage device uh, or something like that. We have a sponsor called Helm at thehelm.com that does a uh, local storage using NextCloud, which is an open source thing. Uh, Synology, NASA's will do it. I mean, another way to store your photos is pay for the storage yourself. Then, you know, if you didn't trust the cloud, I guess that's that's what you would do. Of course, that was a big topic uh, all year long, uh, you know, especially starting in the spring. I think we've all survived, right, the transition to paid Google Photos. Um, as many of you know, I am a ham radio operator. I think it's a great hobby. Amateur radio is pretty darn exciting. We got somebody who called and asked how they could join the fun. Julian's next on the line from Los Angeles. Hello, Julian. Hey, good afternoon, Leo. Good to talk to you again. What's up? Hey. Uh, not much. By the way, quick uh, suggestion for songs for uh, for Kim. A telephone call by Kraftwerk, I think, is an excellent choice. Telephone call from Kraftwerk. Okay. Uh, professor, write it down. <laughs> it. It's, it's really neat. But uh, anyway, uh, aside from uh, mobile device accessibility that I am very passionate about and talk about, quite regularly. Uh, one of my other passions is ham radio. And oh, I didn't know you were ham. Yes, I am. Nice. <laughs> so um, as a blind person, this could be a little challenging. And I have found some great resources, including information on a radio that with just a little bit of uh, modification can be made to be fully accessible to a blind person. And the best part is it's... Uh, you could uh, buy a radio that's less than $100, a handheld radio, yeah. and 
by uploading this open GD77 firmware into it and some voice packs, you now have a, a totally blind-friendly amateur radio that uh, is not very uh, hard on the wallet. That would be the most challenging thing is knowing where you're tuning to, what band you're tuning to. And I, I gather it announces it. It says you're on the 24-meter band, 24.1, 24.2, 24.3, that kind of thing. It, it gives you access to the whole menu system of the radio. Oh, wow, it's everything. Capable nice. Of, uh, one of the digital modes that's now popular on ham radio called DMR. And um, you can have access to all the talk groups, all the contact lists, uh, you know, all the settings in the radio. It's it's a wonderful device. So the way you find out about it is you go to www.blindhams.com. There's a link there that says Ham Radio Links. You click on that. And then you go to Open GD 77 Project for Blind Hams. And there you can find all the information on how to get this radio, how to... Uh, upload this firmware to the radio it's very easy to do and uh, for those who can't do it uh, getting involved with the blind hams network is a wonderful way to meet other blind hams who are doing this sort of thing oh neat so and and even for people who are not hams yet who may be blind and maybe think oh well how could i do this if i can't see you can actually go to that website you can find links to listen to our network live and there's even a uh, madam a skill that if you tell her to enable the blind ham network skill, she'll enable it. And now you can tell her, monitor blind ham's network, and you can listen in on our conversations. And we got all kinds of conversations going on there from tech to regular life, and we help each other out. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful thing to be involved in, and I wanted to share it with the listeners. Always great to hear from you, Julian. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm I'm an older kid. I didn't grow up with computers. I'm 68, and this summer I'll be 69. And I I just wondered if I I took a, a let's say a seminar a while ago, like 20 years ago, and I got heart palpitations. <laughs> you know, there. By the way, I'm 64, so you're not. Oh, you're just a kid. You're not too old for computers. Right. I just have to tell you, yeah. um, but. I think there is a gene, to be honest with you. How, how are you with math? Did you, did you have math phobia in school? Oh, uh, math, uh, I didn't like, I didn't do well with geometry, related algebra I could do. Okay. If I worked at it, I could do it. If I home, did my homework. It's not that you need math. I just feel like there, it's a, maybe it's a similar brain area or something like that. Yeah. That people who have math anxiety often when faced with a computer have the same kind of phobic reaction. It's not a rational reaction, but it's phys it's very much physical, and it makes it very difficult. It sounds like you've got that. It makes it very yeah. difficult for you to... It's a phobia. It's a phobia. And it's, I think, purely psychological. But but I do acknowledge that it's, it's real and it exists. I know many people with it. Uh, I obviously do not have it. <laughs> obviously, Leo. Uh, rub but, it in, rub it in. Rub it in. But, but, uh, so, and I don't know how to cure it necessarily, except, yeah. to, except to remind you that it, a computer isn't actually difficult to understand, or I'll use a term from our generation, grok. Mm -hmm. it, is not, um, it is not out to get you, uh, that, the, that it is... It is it's a block that you have. It's not something that is actually real. And so maybe that helps transcend it. Uh, you, you probably want a gentle, gentle introduction to it. What do you, I think the best way to start using technology is to have a purpose. Yeah. Because what, what often happens with people is it's overwhelming. You don't yeah. know, you yeah. don't have one thing that you want to do, so you try to learn everything and it's yeah. like, ugh. And especially you go to a class, they're going to teach you things like file systems and, you know, come, yeah. you know, and that's not. So is there something like photography, cooking would be one that you want to do with a tech, with technology? That sounds good. I, I cook a bit and I'd like to be able to look up different recipes. Wouldn't that be nice like, to have yeah. uh, to have an online recipe book? Right. Um, I actually use a wonderful program. It's available on every platform, computers as well as mobile devices called Paprika. Oh, okay. Chicken and, paprika, I love that. Paprika. And what, what paprika does is great. It has a browser built in, and you can go to any... You know, there's wonderful recipes on the web. Okay. And this has transformed yeah, yeah. cooking. You, I used to have five shelves of cookbooks. Well, I still have them because I can't throw one away. But, right. but I don't need them anymore because if you want to look how to make, you know, 
um, Sol Munier. Yeah. You type in Sol Munier into the browser, and you'll find a dozen recipes. You look until you see one you like, and then you open it in Paprika, and Paprika extracts oh. the recipe from it and turns it into a format we're used to with ingredients, instructions. Oh, yeah. If there's a picture on the site, it'll put that in there. It might even put nutrition information in if that's available on the site. Yeah. It, and then it adds it to your database, and you have a local database which can be synced from your phone to your tablet to your computer. And the, Okay, so this is an example. This is something you could get into. Okay. And use and go, gosh, I really, I get it. I like it. And in the process, completely transparently, without any confrontation, no triggering of anything of the phobia, yeah. you'll be using a computer. You'll, you'll learn a lot of the skills that translate to other computer programs just by doing that one thing. But oh. because you're doing something you love. Yeah, it helps. It, it helps a lot. It, ta yeah. you, it transfers the phobia to some other portion of your brain because because you're going, oh, look at that Sol Munier. That looks great. Oh. I want to make that. Yeah. Ina Garden has a good one, but so does New York Times Cooking. That's okay. the point. You can look at the different ones and decide. So that's one thing. Photography for a lot of us yeah. is a good entry uh, way into it as well. Yeah. So do you have any devices at all? Well, a friend gave me an old laptop. Well, that's another problem. Old is generally not good. Well, like 10 years old. Yeah, and and so <laughs> on this it. is this is also part of the problem is people who have this uh, aversion to technology will often get something cheap yeah. or something old. Okay. And the f problem is cheap and old is harder to use than modern and uh, new and maybe a little more expensive. Not a lot, but a little yeah. more expensive. So I would f do you f think about what form fact? Do you don't have a smartphone? No, I'm still on a landline. Okay. I miss the 60s. I'm stuck in the 60s. <laughs> Where's Donna Reed when I need her? That's I think for you an iPad would be a good first okay. computer. Okay. Um, and they're, What should I pay for that? Well, they range the least expensive iPads around uh, 329 Okay. That's fine. What is the definition of an iPad? It's from Apple. You can get them online or you can go to the Apple store if it's not too difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go into the Apple store and look at them. Okay. The, the base model, the, origin, the basic iPad, which is modern, it's got the latest processor and everything, is uh, 329 and uh, sometimes on sale down to 300 They go up. You can spend a lot more. For an, there's going to be a new iPad Pro probably on Tuesday that'll oh. be announced, but that'll be a thousand bucks. So oh, wow. that's the range. I, I would start with the I would start with the 329 iPad. Okay. Put Paprika on it. Okay. And just use that. Okay. There's a browser on there. Do you get email? You probably don't get email. Right? No. No. All right. Don't now, have... now here's the other problem. You don't have an internet connection. I'm guessing. No. Does the apartment have an internet? I think they do. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to want to inquire about that. And uh, they'll ha they'll help you set it up, and there'll probably be a fee for that. Yeah. Okay. Now, my other uh, thing I wanted to say is, oh, okay. Years ago, when I took that seminar, it was when they gave you sort of a ruler that had all of these. Yeah. Instructions. Yeah. Way too. Oh, yeah. One for this. No thing. wonder. I, I'm getting a stomach ache just thinking about yes. it. Yes. And and the it was really disgusting and I and I got really upset and then yes. I started, then I took a class at a local community college. Yes. But and every single day it was a different thing. Don't take a class anymore. Okay. And that's exactly why I'm saying pick one thing okay. and get proficient with that one thing. iPad is very simple, very secure, nothing to worry about. As you use that paprika and you get used to that, it's a great device for the kitchen. Yeah. You know, get a little smart cover so you can stand it up and as an easel and look at it while you're cooking. That's a great start. Okay. And then you'll get proficient with that. You'll dig a little deeper into the iPad. I think it won't be long before you're fairly proficient in that. Forget the ruler with yeah. instructions on it. We don't need that anymore. Forget different things every day. Why do they do that to people? And Roger, stay in touch so I can help you on your next steps. Hi, John. Hello. Welcome. I was upgraded from a CDMA to a Volte. Got a Moto G7. Nice. Optimal Max. Love those. Love good choice. Yeah. 
lately it starts uh, rebooting itself when right. I enter the supermarket. <laughs> Six times Wait a minute. On my last Wait a minute. Day. Just the supermarket? Like it doesn't do it anywhere else? Yeah. Yeah, it's Vons and Albertsons. <laughs> It doesn't what? do it at Trader Joe's. What? All right, there's a couple of things I want you to try because we have to diagnose this. I'm going to guess they're using some sort of, I bet you it's electronic theft protection, but some sort of radio signal that your phone is getting confused by. So one thing to try just to see, and you know, you don't have to leave it this way, but is put it in airplane mode before you get near the store. That's turning That's off all idea. the radios, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, right. everything, and see if it does that. But sometimes I want to look up a just for you coupon. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> Likely, <it's not laughs> I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Uh, uh, this is just. Uh, this isn't a permanent thing. This is uh, just a test to see if there's something going on. Oh, wait a minute! Look at this. Chat room has found a uh, Google support note. My supermarket reboots my phone. <laughs> Turn off Bluetooth. Turn off Bluetooth. Uh, Safeway stores have started de deploying. Oh, it is not a security. It's not anti-theft. It's Bluetooth LE beaconing. Um, they can use these for a variety of things. This has been something that uh, has been touted for a while. Museums sometimes use this. Stores use it. The idea is it's a little low-power Bluetooth beacon all over the store they use it for two reasons to track your movements in the store because then they can make a map of how people customers use the store and they can make it a more efficient layout that kind of thing it also if you have a Safeway or a Vons app on there it will interact with that it'll pop up a coupon when you walk next to something so I'm wondering yes <laughs> yes right right exactly um no, tr so this is this is what uh, the poster, and this this is from February, so it's fairly recent. Uh, he said turning off Bluetooth fixed it. Okay. So that is a weird effect, and honestly, they ought to fix this <laughs> uh, because that's a problem for everybody. Turn off Bluetooth. You still can use your internet. You can still look up coupons. Um. I wonder if you put, you said it happens at Safeway and Vons? Uh, Vons and Albertsons. Albertsons. Are they all, I think they're oh, all. the same owner. They're both. It's all Kroger, the same. I think. Yeah. It's, it's all Kroger. Um, they're probably doing the same thing. So try turning off Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. it, it might be, why would it crash the phone? Uh, it, it's, it's not, it's not probably the phone. It's, uh, there's an app maybe that's seeing the beacons and, and overreacting, getting way too excited and going, hey, hey, yeah. And then the phone goes, <laughs> or something. I don't know. It's very, yeah. very weird. It, Do you have the Vaughn? Like the, it seems like it hangs on the blue moto screen. Yeah, at startups for yeah. a longer time than a, sure. a normal startup. Sure, do. so annoying. Apparently, uh, Dr. Mom in our chat room is saying the malls managed by Simon, the biggest mall company in America, also are using that. Also, reboot phones. So, <laughs> geez, Louise, it isn't just that one company. Um, I do you have a Vons or Albertsons app on your phone? Both. Okay. So uh, that may also be that the Vons and Albertsons act, app are waking up and then crashing the phone. So tr first turn off the Bluetooth. If that fixes it, okay, yeah, we've narrowed it down. It's the Bluetooth beaconing. It may be that deleting either the Vons or the Kroger app fixes that as well. But but you don't need Bluetooth in the store. So turn off Bluetooth. Right. In fact, this might be a good advice for anybody who doesn't want to be tracked as they shop. You know, I'm not saying necessarily they're using it for nefarious purposes. They're, they're probably using it to map, uh, you know, traffic in the store to figure out, you know, well, there's lots of things you could figure out. And, of course, in the high traffic areas is where you're going to put the end caps that, you know, Pepsi-Cola pays extra money for. You're going to put those there, things like that. If you don't like being tracked in the grocery store, turning off Bluetooth will, will eliminate that. And it won't And Your phone should not crash. John, I'm so glad you called because... You know, I wasn't aware of this. That is very interesting. 
Will you have a link to that uh, Google article? I the, shall. Um, I shall. And it, it specifically mentions the G7, which is interesting. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so it may be a it may be a bug in the G7's software, um, and I suspect if it is that they'll fix this. You know that that either Motorola or Google's Android will will have a patch at some point because that's exactly what you don't want to have happen when somebody enters your store, right? That's kind of kind of. I mean, you're a good person. You you're trying to figure this out. I think there's some people would just say, "Well, I'm not going there anymore." <laughs> I'm not going there I've anymore. Several of the uh, the managers in the store, if it happens to anyone else, and no one's ever heard of it, so uh, yeah. Well, I'm sending you the link. You can give them the link and say, "Well, guess what?" Yeah. And Safeway's doing it. Okay. Safeway's doing it, and apparently Simon Malls are doing it. So this is mm -hmm. going to be more common um, all all around. Hey, I'm I'm really glad you called. What an interesting bug. I'm glad I did too. Thank you much. Thanks, John. It's kind of amazing. Uh, thanks to our fabulous chat room, all of our listeners. Uh, there's probably very few mysteries that we can't solve. I mean, they, they come up. But that that's fascinating. How are you, sir? I am well. How are you? So much better. A uh, week ago, my Apple Watch reported AFib. Oh, my. In Kona, Hawaii. Wow. You were on vacation? I was on vacation. And what did the watch and do? Did it buzz? Did it buzz? Did it say, hey, 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 get a doctor? What did it do? I was taking a nap and the alarm, of course, I honestly, I don't remember. The one question you have, I don't remember. It woke me up from a nap and I literally had to drive myself 30 miles to a hospital. Holy cow. The doctor... The doctor in the hospital said that it's possible the Apple Watch saved my life. It sounds like it did. Had you ignored it, who knows what would have happened? Wow. that You know, we hear these stories from time to time, but this is the first time I've ever talked to anybody that actually saved your life. That is pretty cool. Pretty cool. I have become, I have become an Apple fan. And one of the uh, byproducts of this is my wife can no longer say anything when I want to upgrade my watch <laughs> for the rest of my life. Honey, it's a life-saving tool. <laughs> so how are you feeling now? Are you okay? Um, I'm, I'm well on the road to recovery. Good. I've never had a food before, and I'm, I'm quite healthy. Um, I have been a fan of yours for decades since... Um, uh, uh, screensaver days. Thank you, Richard. You know, I wear one. I uh, love my Apple Watch. Uh, you know, when it first came out, I was skeptical, wore it a little bit. But now, thanks to the variety of things it does, and you just added one more, I am i don't take it off. I got my 88-year-old mom an Apple Watch, too, because I wanted a, the fall protection and the uh, emergency call feature. But that's another great feature. Had you Do you have to turn something on on the watch to have it be monitoring for that, or it just does that automatically? It's As far as I know, it's a default. And if I give, nice. can give you another maybe 15 seconds... This thing goes off. I wake up from a nap, and of course, the first thing you do is go down the river of denial. Right. Oh, it's just a watch. How could it know? None of this is happening. I feel fine. That's one of the problems with AFib is you might feel fine. Anyway, I cleaned off the sensors, and I used the pulse uh, the ability to take a pulse quickly. Yes. Which I had on my watch face. Yes. And one pulse came in a little over 50. Another pulse came in over 150. Whoa. And I said, I've got, I've got to go now. <laughs> Let's go to the doctor. Wow. Good for you. Now, I'm sure your doctor told you about this, but there's another device that you can get for under 100 bucks. That uh, I, uh, friends of mine who've had AFib swear by. It's called the Cardia. Are you familiar with the Cardia? You might have seen I'm it. Right. I'm right. I'm <laughs> Yeah. AliveCore.com. It is a very interesting two-thumb EKG. It's not as good as the 
multi lead EKG they'll, EKG they'll give you in the hospital, obviously. But it is a really great thing for people who've had uh, AFib. Uh, it'll send it. It'll detect uh, atrial fibrillation, brachy, bradycardia, tachycardia, uh, and you can send it off to a doctor or your doctor. Um, so, I, as a public service announcement uh, on your behalf, AliveCore, A L I V E C O R dot com, and it's inexpensive. It works with your smartphone, uh, and I think it's a really, really good idea. So, I am so Richard. I'm so glad to hear that you're all right, and I'm thrilled to hear that the watch saved your life. That's fantastic. Well done. This was the right place to share it. Um, I have, of course, become an evangelist. I bet. To be honest with you, I can't even get my own family to wear Apple watches. Ugh. So we're all caught up in it. <laughs> Listen, it saved Richard's life. It could save yours. That's really great, Richard. Thank you for the call. It's a pleasure talking to you. I'm glad you're safe and sound. We're going to be going out to uh, the Big Island ourselves in a couple of months. Was it a nice visit other than that? It, I can't say enough about living in a postcard. Yeah. Um, and the people, the people of Hawaii I love are the people. extraordinary. Yeah. And I kept joking that it must be something in the water. <laughs> well, there's a lot of it, <laughs> especially on the wet side. <laughs> hey, it's a pleasure talking to you, Richard. I'm glad you're okay. That is such a great story. What a great... By the way, my Apple Watch is telling me I should stand up right now. I guess I should listen to it. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have a great day. My watch tells me to stand up. It tells me to sit down. It tells me to breathe. And I know it's doing it out of love. Well, I don't think the watch loves me, but it's but, it's, but it cares about me. Wow, what a story from uh, Richard. You know, you hear these stories, you see them in the news and so forth, but to actually talk to somebody for whom the Apple Watch was uh, such a lifesaver is 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 pretty dramatic, pretty pretty amazing. Uh, I wear mine all the time. I hope I never have to use it like uh, Richard did, but uh, it's really it's really good to have. Really good news. We've got more in our Best of the Tech Guys show. I will be back, by the way, uh, tomorrow, January 2nd. We're going to have a regular Tech Guys show. We'll be answering your calls again. And, uh, I hope you had a wonderful holiday. Happy New Year to you all. Here's a, <laughs> a question from a guy <laughs> who has an interesting project he's working on. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I'm wonderful. How are you? Oh, I don't know. It depends on your answer. Oh, uh-oh. What's the matter? Oh, no. So I'm staring at my neighbor's house right now that I have decided is the greatest movie projector screen I could ever have. <laughs> the, wait a minute. Do the neighbors know about this? They do not, but they never will. There's no windows on this side. They've got three sheds lined up that they never go to. So they will never know. They'll never know that you are watching movies on the side of their house. Now, is it a flat surface? It's not shingles or anything. Nope, it's a flat stuccoed surface. Nice. Okay. Stucco might be a little problematic, but okay. So what I'm wondering, it's not white. It's kind of a, I guess you'd call it a grayish, light gray. Light gray might be okay. I, so oh. movie screens, as you know, are usually white. And in fact, they go beyond that. Uh, they have often reflective materials in them. You can buy, and if your neighbors aren't paying any attention, you could use... <laughs> projector screen paint they sell it uh that has this reflective material in it and makes it a brighter picture it won't so the gray is neutral so it won't ruin the picture but it will mean it's not as bright and whites won't be white they'll be gray but, okay. the, but they won't they might be usable <laughs> is there a projector that will help to contrast out the gray with white the brightest projector you can get is the answer. Okay. How far away from the projector would the house be? Um, where I'm going to be sitting, I'd say 25 foot. I shouldn't really help you with this. <laughs> so 25 feet is a <laughs> I mean, honestly. Over for the Super Bowl. Yeah, just invite them over and say, hey, look, we're watching the Super Bowl on your house. Right. Um, so 25 feet is a fairly distant uh, uh screen for a TV projector. You're going to you may you may be pricing yourself out of 
the picture here because this is you're going to want to get a very expensive uh, projector. At this point, as I've told my wife, with the remodel of the backyard, it's only money at this point. <laughs> Well, there are projectors. What you're looking for is something called a long throw projector, okay. and you're looking for one that's bright. Um, okay. You know, a thousand lumens would be nice. Uh, that's going to be a little hard to get. But, I mean, if you think about it, your movie theater, 25 feet, that's, you know, at least, right, from the projector yeah. to... But your movie theater, if it's running, um, you know, a, a DLP projector, the kind that you would want, you're not going to have, obviously, you're not going to have film reels. Uh, if they're running a digital projector, they're spending maybe ten to fifty thousand dollars on at least on that. Now, getting a nice big Runco, for instance, uh, projector. But there are, uh, you know, Epson makes a long throw projector that has thirty three hundred lumens. That's pretty bright. The home cinema, and that's not expensive. It's six hundred bucks. Um, are you gonna? One thing you're gonna want is to get the projector as much as possible pointing at the middle of the house. Or the middle of the picture, not the middle of the house. The middle of where you want the picture, because you don't want okay. most of these. Most of these will have a skew feature where you can turn a dial and it'll skew the picture a little bit. But if if the projector is not shooting ex exactly perpendicularly to the house, then uh, to the screen, then it'll then the then the the screen will be uh, keystone a little bit. The picture will be keystone a little bit. So you want ideally to have. If you think about it, the house is a, is a, a straight up and down vertical plane, and you will want to have the projector perpendicular to that, to the center of that image as best you can. I would look at the, you know what, this isn't that expensive. The Epson Home Cinema, it's a 1080p projector, that's fine. 3,300 lumens, that's pretty bright. I think you're going to get a, a good result out of that. It's got very good white brightness, and it's not expensive. It's about 600 bucks. Perfect. My wife won't kill me after all. Oh, yay. Now, the other thing you could do is get a drone. No, no, no. Never mind. <laughs> well, I went through that, Leo. My wife broke my drone. I was using it to chase the birds off my pole line. <laughs> you're good. You're a do-it-yourselfer, Brian. I could tell. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, there are lots of co companies. You know, this would be a good question for uh, Scott. Uh, lots of companies that make long-throw projectors designed for... You know, a lot of them are designed for outdoor use, to be honest. You're going to bring it in. You're not going to leave it out in the outside. But, uh, you know, there's there's a... I'm looking at a projector that has a, a 10,000 lumen projector. Just the, the brighter the bulb, the more expensive it's going to get. That's all. Okay. Hey, have fun. I hope your neighbor never finds out. How would your neighbor know, right? They were not going to know. Exactly. Unless they go for a walk and they see... <laughs> they see Bill Murray projected yeah. eight feet tall on the side of their house. I, why would they know? <laughs> <laughs> you have a wonderful voice. Life, <laughs> you too. It sounds like you're planning one. What I'm calling about, uh, my wife and I are both retired uh, recently uh, after the last two or three years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm, I'm a, I keep bees. And oh, neat. Do you do it for honey? Oh, yeah, I've got, I just harvested some the other day. Do you sell it uh, commercially or do you just do it for fun? Just for fun. Nice. But there is a local ch children's science museum that I volunteered at back in the 90s when my kids were young. And due to work and other things, I got away from that. And then now that I'm retired, I'm getting back into it. Good. And there, you know, it, beekeeping has changed. I got, my first hives when I was 12. I'm 65 now. Wow. Uh, beekeeping has changed because we didn't, back then, we didn't have all the issues with mites and now a high beetle issue. Yeah, we're, we're worried about our bee population. Yes. So I'm reworking a hive for the museum. Nice. Uh, instead of just a plain, plain Jane white boxes, I've got a laser engraver. So I stuck the high nice. through that and lasered stuff in, hand painted it back oh, in. Oh, how nice. And one of the things I'm wanting to do, uh, and probably won't be this year, next year once we get the hive reestablished and going, I want to do a like a classroom presentation, but I want to, I will be outside where the hive is working the hive. Oh, neat. And stuff. 
and I want to, and I'll have a screen inside. Right. And I want to do two. Yeah, because the kids don't want to get anywhere near those bees. I know the bees are not are, are harmless, but they don't want to go anywhere near them. I know. <laughs> Actually, this year they have been docile as can be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway. So you want a camera? You want to do it live, right? I want. Yeah. I want to. I want to know a good recommendation for a camera. Uh, what to do for audio? Honestly, I mean, you could do this with your smartphone. If you don't mind streaming to Facebook or YouTube, you could stream to YouTube Live. That if you put the YouTube app on your smartphone, the camera nowadays on most up-to-date smartphones is as good as you're going to get on a, any camcorder, and the and the microphone's probably pretty good too. Although uh, you can with either an iPhone or Android phone get an external mic or even a a wired mic that would then. Uh, you know, you could put on your lapel and uh, that would be a little bit better audio. But I don't think you need to go out and get a whole lot of extra stuff. I think that that smartphone streaming to YouTube and then the kids, of course, on their computers open up YouTube. It could be a private stream and they watch it and they'll probably be very comfortable doing that. No bees anyway. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. What kind of phone? Do you have a, a late model smartphone, Joe? I have a, a Samsung. I think it's an S. Or yeah, something. that'll do it. Yeah. And but uh, you know, since they have a, a, a good network and the main hub is close to where the hive is actually located at. So I was looking at some doing some cameras and I'm also looking at taking a Raspberry Pi and adding some sensors and doing a temperature and humidity sensor oh, inside wow. the hive and outside the hive. Those kids are so lucky. And I also have looking at a way to fit a camera inside the hive. Yeah, I found, I found a streaming site that has one, and it's you know, you know they're fascinating to watch. I used to oh, do outreach programs, absolutely so conservation hives to the schools. So, and I also do, used to do astronomy programs. We had a portable planetarium, and I'd take to school. Oh, that. that's so cool! This is those kids are lucky. You know, Amazon sells very cheaply. They call them endoscopes because the doctors used them to to go down your throat. <laughs> yeah. But you could, but they're very small, basically uh, pinhole cameras, tiny little cameras that you can put in a hive, and it has a wire coming out, and it can go to your phone, or it can go to another device, and they're not very expensive. Yeah. Their plumbers use them to inspect pipes. One in a box right now. Oh, you all, you know all about it. So yeah, but uh, yeah, it's you know it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things interesting in, in the bees, I, I have a, in my workshop. I used to keep a observation hive out there in the winter time, and I don't heat my shop unless I'm working out there. In the winter time, it can be twenty or thirty degrees out there Yikes. inside the beehive. Yeah, ninety five degrees. They keep it warm, don't they? Isn't that interesting? Oh, it, it's amazing how they can heat the hive. Bees so. are remarkable. Yeah, you know, they are, and it's it's watching you know watching the what they call the bee dance when you know uh, a worker goes out and finds a nectar source. They come back to the hive. They do a little figure eight pattern on the comb, and it tells some yeah other bees in the hive which way. Isn't that amazing? How what kind of honey do you get? Well, right now is we have a lot of sweet clover in bloom. And oh, I love clover honey on the ground. Oh, but I these love are that. taller bushes and. Some of the honey I've harvested off recently is lighter in color than vegetable oil. I mean, it's, it's mm. almost it's almost water clear. Wow, uh, is that good? On the time of the yeah, it's 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 nice. I like darker honey, and depends on the time of the year what trees are in blossom. <laughs> Lisa uh, joined a Honey of the Month club. We'd get two bottles of honey <laughs> from all over the country, and in fact, I think Tennessee is one of them. But from Texas, from all over New England, all different flavors. Uh, you know, depending on what flowers uh, the bees were uh, eaten. And it is, I love it. And it's there's such variety. There's raw, there's dark, there's light. There's such variety. It's amazing. Well, a lot of what you buy at the store is so ultra processed. I don't like that. Yeah. So this club yeah. was good because it was, a lot of it was raw and it, it was all, it was all small producers, people like you. And it was so good. Oh. I have a friend who's into it big time. He has over 300 hives. Hmm. And he's harvest. I mean, he keeps his hives in several different states, and uh, he's also head of their state association. I might, I might want to do this when I retire. This sounds like fun, Joe. Hey, I got to run. I appreciate it. It's, it's good to talk to you. I think you got it all set up. It sounds like you're going to be a great teacher. Yeah, renew your ham license. I will. I will. I'm going to do that right now. For UJC.
Oh, W6TWT. 7-3, Joe. Bye-bye. Unfortunately, uh, she never followed up with a call about uh, about using it, whether she was able to get all this working. I hope she did. One of the best parts of the show is when people call and say, you know what you, uh, I always get nervous because they say, you know, you, I asked you a question three weeks ago. You gave me an answer. And I always go, and? But most of the time it's uh, it's happy. So if, if you're still listening, uh, let us know uh, how your beekeeping went. Meanwhile, Micah wants to move out of Maine. Uh, Mike is a regular on the show, and he's looking to find a good email provider. This is one of those calls that got me up on my soapbox. I've been talking about this all year long. Email. Listen. Hey, Leo. Great to talk to you as always. I really need your help today. I oh, no. Oh, Nothing no. terrible. Nothing broken, but this is stuff you know. You could you could be talking about this in your sleep. You'd get it, and you get the question kind of often, too, I'm afraid. But it's time for me to get a domain. Uh, not because I need a domain, but because eventually I'm going to be able to get rid of Spectrum. I don't know when, but with all the infrastructure improvement and everything that's happening here in Maine, I may be able to change my Internet service provider, which means I'll need to give up my Maine.rr.com oh. email, which is my oh. <laughs> Hey, wh wh what's happening? You said everything that's happening in Maine. What's happening in Maine? Oh, there's a huge Internet thing going on where they want to expand high-speed Internet into the northern parts of Maine and all through the rest of Maine where it isn't available. If you get up into a uh -huh. county, yeah. you know, up near Presque Isle and, and, and Caribou and those areas, it's really hard to, to yeah, find southern Southern Internet Maine service. is basically, you know... Uh, you know, I don't know what Massachusetts or what's the southern. Right. Yeah, I mean it's northern Massachusetts. Northern Massachusetts. Portland it's and, it's and, 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 it's urban. Yeah. But then it, it, so everybody, I think when they hear Maine, they think you know rocky beaches and and uh, pioneers and log cabins and stuff. That's up north. <laughs> right, <laughs> That's north, up and north. But north and west. North and west. When you're on the southern coast, where 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 Spectrum and, and Xfinity and Net, you know all those other horrible guys. So the state is is doing this though, which is kind of cool. I like that. Oh yeah, there's been bond issues, and we're gonna a lot of our uh, infrastructure money that we're getting Good. from all this is, uh, is going to, going to go this way. It's, it's wonderful. Nice. But are you in rural Maine or are you in uh, Massachusetts no, I'm North? In, I'm in Massachusetts North. <laughs> okay. I'm in Portland, and, okay. and and I'm and I'm stuck with Spectrum, and I've been with them since. Oh, I know. Were, you know, a local company, and, and you know, there's nothing you can do. It's a monopoly. And if the FCC would require these monopoly cable companies to open up their fiber cables, oh, the I agree. Required, you know the way they required the regular copper companies I'm with to you. open up their copper. Yep. You know, then we wouldn't have this. But the cable reason, companies whined that back when this was, uh, you know, bruited about. They said, "No, if you make us do that, we're j we can't. It won't. We can't afford to dig all those trenches, and we'll just stop expanding." Which, of course, is a lie. It's the same lie every you know AT and T told, Comcast told, when they these mergers, they just lie. They say, oh, no, that'd be bad. You can't do that. Oh, we just have to leave the bit. We'd go bankrupt. No. <laughs> yeah. No. It's, it's like Comcast acquiring NBC. Yeah. How yeah. Can, they, they violated the, the, the act that was put together with the movie theaters. Yeah. How can you both be creating and distributing the exactly. thing? Exactly. Micah, monopoly. you're preaching to the choir. I love it. You're absolutely right. <laughs> absolutely right. So, but anyway, you're going to leave Spectrum? You're going to leave them? What's going on? I, uh, when the time comes, I want to be able to, but I need to have really good email. Mm. So, what I so you've, is I you've been listening to me finally. preaching for this. So Absolutely. I'll say it again. But Email's too important to be treated as just like, oh, it's a benefit I get from my Internet service provider. Or, oh, I'll use the free Gmail or whatever. It's too important. So spend a little money. And get it up, set up right. Once you do this once, and it'll be yours for life. And the first thing to do is just as you said, get a domain name. Like now, you know, here's where the question comes in, Leo. Yes, because you, you, you. I know that one of your sponsors has been, and I hope maybe still is. Hover, uh, good, so good people. So where did Airline Pilot Guy go? Oh, no, no. Airline Pilot Guy is a podcast that belongs to someone else. I confuse I you me. with Airline Pilot. Me. You're who? And I'm the air with the airplane. I'm with the. I'm friends with the airline pilot. Guy airplane geek. I love him. Jeff <laughs> Nielsen, who runs that, is great. But I'm part of the airplane geek. Well, where did airplanegeeks.com come from? Who? Where do they go to? We have that. I don't know where they register it, and I have an email address with them. But 
I want to get my own. <laughs> so, so this is the, you want micageek.com or something like right. that. And I agree exactly. with you. You should absolutely do that. But the question is this. I know you also like fast mail. So I'm looking at fast mail and I'm looking at the prices because I'm a cheapskate too. I don't mind. $90 a year is fair for 100 gigabytes. But if I get my email with Hover, it's I can cheaper. get yes. one terabyte a year yes. for $30. Yes. Am I making a mistake? No. Hover's good, good email system. Uh, here's why I like, to, I like to decouple... In the ideal world, money being e all other things being equal, you know, the money being the same, it would be nice to have an email service decoupled from the domain registrar. In fact, I th my preference is to only use a domain registrar like Hover for domain names so that it's easy to move stuff around, right? Uh, and it still would be easy even if you used Hover for email. If at some point you said, I want to use Gmail instead, it wouldn't be so hard to do. But I just like separating the two for some, you know, it's just, I'm like separate. It's not, I'm a components guy, not an all-in-one guy. But it's That's nothing wrong with it. Hover's email is good. Uh, fa the reason I spend money on fast mail, and by the way, I think I don't spend quite as much money uh, as, as 90 bucks a year. It's, well, it's close. It's $230 for three years. So it's, what is that? That's a little less than 80 bucks, 78 bucks a year. Uh, to me, that's worth it. But again, if you, you're right, Hover's a lot cheaper for more storage. So um, maybe it's very similar. There's, there's some things I can do. For instance, I use Fastmail as a DNS system. They offer domain names as well. So I register. So, for instance, I registered. Let me, let me find a domain name I don't mind giving out. Lottle.fun. L-O-T-L dot fun. Lottle fun. At Hover, they are still the registry of records, so it'll renew through them. But then I said to Hover, now let Fastmail handle the DNS, including the mail. And that's actually a little bit better because Hover does a lot of things, or uh, not Hover, um, Fastmail does a lot of things with the email for uh, authentication. There's a, several different email authentication technologies. And, and uh, Fastmail, like DKIM and SPF, does that automatically. Uh, I know Hover might, actually. I, I would look. I just technically, I think Fastmail is a little bit more advanced, but you pay for that. So the short answer to your question, I just gave you the very long answer, is yes, get a domain name at Hover or anywhere else. Most registrars open offer email as well. That's the easiest to set up. Go for that. I'll tell you why I actually, uh, the biggest difference from uh, for me and the reason I use Fastmail, Hover charges for additional addresses. So if you get, uh, you know, Micah's email.com and you want Micah at Micah email.com, but also info at Michael email.com or my grandma at Micah email.com, each one of those will cost you more. With Fastmail, you have an infinite number. So in other words, it depends how you want to use it, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with using Hover. I have just never, I've never used them for email, so I, I'm not sure what the capabilities are, but I do remember that was the big one for me was I like to have a lot of aliases with every email account. And I was hoping for that, too. And I assumed that I could, with one terabyte, that I would be able to create... Uh, it's not merely the storage. Yeah, it's not merely yeah. the storage. They charge you for additional addresses. Okay. So well, I would check there's that. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah, I would check that. Um, unless it says, now, add as many email addresses as you need. But what they don't tell you is, I, they charge, I, would, I would look at their pricing and, and see. Uh, yeah, terabyte, $29 a year. Um, but how many addresses do you get? I don't know. And they do webmail and IMAP, both of which you'd want. Um, I think you charge, I think they charge for additional. We tell you, man, if you're, yeah, they don't say specifically. Let me see if I can find, um, adding email addresses. Well, I would look into that. FAQ under billing and payments that probably explain that. Yeah, and I think they have a help phone number, so if I get yeah. that bad, I could always call yeah. them. That's, the, that's for me the big one, because what I do with my fast mail addresses is I say, look, anything at, 
lot of fun goes to my inbox. But then when I sign up for stuff, I will sign up. When I signed up for Verizon, it was Verizon at Lotto Fun or, you know, uh, Blue Apron at Lotto Fun. I always use the name of the company at the email address. I don't use Lotto Fun for that, but that's what I do. So that's a nice little thing, um, you know, just so that everybody has a unique address. It makes it easier to filter and also lets you know if they're selling your address. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that makes complete sense. So having in ability to create infinite email addresses at that domain is a big thing for me. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. What happened? Hey, good morning, Leo. How good are morning. you? Good morning. I'm fine. How are you? More to the point. Well, yeah, well, we're great. Unfortunately, my wife dumped a whole bowl of sugar on my laptop computer. That not on purpose, right? No, no, no. It was a complete and total accident. How do you dump a bowl? Okay, I, I, I don't even need to know. Uh, the laptop was on a kitchen counter, partially my fault. Yeah, that's what she's saying. That's her story, and she's sticking with it. Um, was it wet sugar or just dry sugar? Dry granulated sugar. That's good, because if it had been wet, that would have been a problem. It would have penetrated in, and uh, and that's like if you spilled a soda pop on your keyboard, that usually means it's over. So this is a laptop, and it and it and it didn't penetrate, right? It's just granules. Exactly right. Yeah. Can you shake it out? A little bit crunchy now. <laughs> okay. So here's here's what I would suggest. Most laptops, you can remove those keycaps. Before you do that, take a picture, please. And I only know this from all my personal experience. <laughs> Having removed the keycaps and then going, oh crap! I know it's Q W E R T Y, but where does uh, where does this go? So take a picture uh, so you know where all the keycaps are going to go, and then you can gently. Uh, use a butter knife since you're in the kitchen. Pry off the keycaps, and what that's going to do is expose the switches underneath, and that's where the crunch, <laughs> where the, the the crunchy goodness lies. And you could blow it out with a compressed air, or I wouldn't use your breath, <laughs> but um, and I wouldn't use a hair dryer, nothing warm. But you could blow it out with compressed air. Be careful when you use compressed air on a computer, because uh, if you keep pressing the squeezing the button. It starts getting condensation. It's so cold. And then you're blowing moisture in the computer. Moisture is the enemy. So remove the keycaps. Shake it. Shake it. Shake, shake, shake. If you've got a little, you know, they make little computer vacuum cleaners, little tiny vacuum cleaners. That would work. Uh, Burke, who is our repair guy here at the studio, says, no, don't blow on it. No, no compressed air. Vacuum. Uh, but nobody probably has a vacuum small enough. But you can get those granules out. It's, chances are it hasn't penetrate into the mechanism most laptops the keyboard is kept somewhat separate from the insides not maybe waterproof so whatever you do don't get it wet at this point take off the keycaps shake it out put them back you're good to go so <laughs> and one of the things i love about doing the radio show is i talk to real people with real problems including granulated sugar in the in the laptop. Uh, it is so much fun talking to everybody on the Tech Guy. And, uh, if you listen, whether you listen on your local radio station or you listen on a podcast, I'm so glad uh, that you listen. Uh, you know I do it every weekend, Saturday and Sunday from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, if you have a local station uh, that broadcasts a show, you can listen and call in live there. Of course, you can always consume the podcast. We even stream it live. So if you don't have a local radio station, you go to twit.tv slash live and watch the live streams there. 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time, Saturday and Sunday. Or subscribe to the podcast or both. Or both. Thank you so much for listening to the show, for uh, subscribing to our podcast. Uh, for those of you who are Club Twit members, I thank you especially for your support this year. We launched Club Twit. It's been a great success. Thousands of members making a big difference uh, in our operating budget, but also, I think, helping form an amazing community in the special Twit, uh, Club Twit Discord server, the events we have, the Untitled Linux show, Stacy's Book Club, the Ask Me Anythings that we do, the game nights. They've all been so much fun. Uh, if you're interested, if you're not a member, go to twit.tv slash club twit. And again, if you are a member, thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Thanks to all of you. Have a wonderful new year. Happy new year. I'll be the last to say it. Happy new year. And I'll be back tomorrow with the Tech Guy Show. We'll see you then. Bye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. 
And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.